We'd like to welcome everyone to another episode of the Gangster Chronicles podcast. My name is Big Steel, along with my homeboy. Yeah. And you know, hey, we don't have a lot of people up in here, man. We don't have some legendary people, man. But tonight, we got some West Coast royalty up in here. They kind of come out. You know, I know Coco is definitely from your class. Tony A came next. Um, we got the legendary Tony A, the wizard. Thank you, my bro. Legendary DJ and a homeboy. Legendary, the most featured man in hip-hop. That's what they say. You know, Mr. Jerry Long, a.k.a. Cocaine. What's cracking, homies? Jerry, I'm right here, my brother. Jerry. Thank you, uh, first and foremost, for uh, the invite. Thank you. Thank you, Abe. Appreciate it. Oh, for sure, man. We've been meaning to get you on here a long time. And Coco was like a friend of the show. You know, he got like a, a card. He got the little Gangster Chronicle card in his wallet that he carried around with him. He just, you know, pop, pull in, <laughs> pull up all the time. You know, I want to. I always wanted to ask you a question, man. With California's climate being what it is, with the black and brown, you know it's getting a lot better. Yeah. You know it's got definitely better over the years. Prison politics often influence the streets. Yeah. And I don't think nobody ever give you and Crawford I C props for what y'all pulled off, especially in that time period. Yeah. You know, you and I C got together and put out a you know a legendary street album, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, first and foremost, let, let me just, can I, do you mind if I share how I met Crawford? Yeah, for sure. Well, Crawford was probably about 16 years old. He was still going to Centennial High School. And uh, for people that may not know, I started doing mixed tapes for Steve Yano at the Rhodium, 1987 to 1991. And on those tapes featured Dre, Cube, Easy, JJ Fad, Tone Low, Young MC, High C, DJ Quick, AMG, Second Ton, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I must have did maybe about 30 of those mixed tapes back then. And uh, what happened was, Dre and them were getting ready to go on tour. And Dre had told me, I'm not going to be able to rap on those mixtapes anymore. You're going to have to get somebody else. I was like, all right, cool. So, and then uh, Steve Yano tells me, hey, man, there's a blood way in the back. He's from uh, Treetop, Piru. He's a youngster. You know, maybe you might want to talk to him. He's got a kind of an easy E voice. I said, all right, cool. <laughs> Went over there, met him. And uh, we hit it off. Everything was good, man. You know, to speed uh, things along, he came over to my house and he rapped. And I'll be honest, when I told him this, I didn't think he was that good of a rapper at 16 years old. But here's what won me over. Uh, he calls me up and he goes, hey man, I'm performing at my school Centennial. Would you come and spin for me? And I said, yeah, okay, I took my turntables. And what I really, really liked about him was at 16 years old, how he engaged with the crowd. Yeah, he got hella, he got, he got hella showmanship. Yeah, so at that time, that's pretty much what I said. Like I told Steve, let's get, let's get him on a mixtape. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I will say this uh, to address your question. I grew up in Wilmington. When my family first came from Mexico, we moved to Compton, and I was there till I was about nine years old. Mm -hmm. Then from there, we moved to Wilmington, which I still live. Mm -hmm. Wilmington was blacks and Mexicans. Mm -hmm. You know, on the west side, you had uh, water from Piru. On the east side, you had uh, east side pain, bloods, all bloods. And then you had east side Wilmas, west side Wilmas, okay? And um, to be honest, too, I think a lot of people are going to trip that growing up, I had more black friends than I did Mexican friends. Okay. You know, so to me, that was never an issue. Was that because of the music and hip hop? I think it was the hip hop culture, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people may not know that uh, Michael Chambers, who's known as Boogaloo Shrimp or Turbo, mm -hmm. um, was from the east side of Wilmington, okay? And uh, he was one year older than me. So he actually taught me how to pop. So I hung around with him for a while. And uh, from there, I was about 15 years old when I met DJ Joe Cooley from Compton. Mm -hmm. He taught me how to spin. Uh, he was pretty much my mentor. Soon after that, Steve Yano introduced me to Dre. Okay, and then eventually, I get introduced uh, by Crawford High C to DJ Quick. So that's really like my school right there. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, that uh, being Mexican, I got a lot of shit for hanging around blacks. And I never, never understood that, you know. One of my uh, brothers uh, married a black one, so I got black in my family, I got white in my family, mm -hmm. I got Filipino, Vietnamese, you know, so, and I'm glad that uh, God allowed the rainbow colors in my family, you know what I'm saying, because, so, but as far as that is concerned, I always got a lot of shit because why, why are you over there fucking with the blacks, why don't you help Rasa? Mm -hmm. And I was always straight up. I always said, look bro, when I meet Rasa that can rap, then I'll fuck with them. And that was it. Oh, wow, man, because, yeah. What you say, Coco? No, I'm just listening. So, at the time, 
when you started spinning and rap, there were no, nobody was interested as far as trying to get into hip hop. You think that was it as far as the Mexican side? Okay, uh, Frost, uh, I know he had a song called Rough Cuts. I think that was like an 88. Right. Kid Frost. Then he had another song called Terminator. He didn't drop La Raza till 1990. Uh, around 89, 90, there was another rap group that I, uh, they were uh, called Spanish Fly. I remember, that's uh, a legendary um, group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Esther Rich Rock, uh, DJ Tricks, and uh, Daz. And um, I was working with Esther Rich Rock, but when he got with the group, I pretty much just left them alone. It was either going to be High C or Esther Rich Rock uh, rapping on my mixtapes. Mm-hmm. And when he got with the group, I just left them alone and I started uh, you know, messing around with High C. Other than that, I didn't really know too many other Chicano rappers that wanted to rap, you know? So uh, everybody that I was working with was, happened to be black, and I, I didn't have an issue with that. But even today, though, today I still get a lot of shit on my podcast because people still say, all you wanted to do was fuck with those blacks and you never wanted to help our people out. Well, there was none of our people rapping, you know? Yeah. And when I started working with, with black artists, I got paid. In the late 90s, when I started working with Raza rappers, they weren't paying me. And then at the end of the day, it is a business. Yeah. And like you said, during that time period, it's not like it was an overabundance. I don't even think Chicano rap, what they call Chicano rap, was mm. around yet. Right. right. That, that didn't exist yet. That hadn't been created. Right. You know, you had Kid Frost. Um, I would see Mellow Man Ace. That was a little bit later on, right? They actually dropped the same year, 1990. Yeah, yeah. You had Mellow Man Ace. So it wasn't no whole. It wasn't like it was a whole bunch of people, because I heard a Spanish fly because I had a record store and it was a cat named Murray Brumfield. Yes. They had. He had kind of like he had really kicked off the Chicano rap stuff, and a lot of people don't know Murray Brumfield was a black guy that was yeah. a teacher at Norwalk High School. That was one of the founding people. I, I don't want to give no misinformation. As far as from what I know, me being yeah. a retailer, yes. I didn't see no other like Chicano rap. I knew the kids from the high school that started coming to the store and asked for it. Yeah. And that's when I said they may have some. So when Murray Brumfield walked in my store, I was like, you know what? I don't know who none of these people is, but hell yeah, because I got people asking for this. They starting to ask for it. So it was definitely a grassroots movement. And... We got some OGs in here tonight because, Coco, you pretty much got started around the same time, but you were out in Pomona, right? Right. You I, start, a- I started uh, my career in 84. 84. So you so you precede everybody up here. What You know, everybody as far as – um. so you was on in 84? Well, I, man, coming from my dad and coming from Uncle Will. Oh, yeah, that's right. You had a history. You know, and I, I was already – we had the cheat code. But 80, 84 was around the time. And then prior to signing um, with uh, Easy E, I, I first was going to sign with Bobcat. That's what I was going to say, DJ Bobcat. Yep. And 1986 and 87, I was uh, with my Uncle Willie Hutch label, but that didn't work out because, you know, they had a certain style and they didn't like mm-hmm. all that cussing and all that shit. So mm-hmm. but really started back in 1984, 40 years ago. If I may interject, I met him, I believe it was 1988, uh, one of the times that when Le- you came up there with Layla to Audio Achievements. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's when I had met him. Yeah, you mentioned Audio Achievements with Donovan Dirtbiker. Um, Smith. Yeah. Th- they yeah. did all the, that, that was where NWA recorded all their stuff, right? That was where Dre was at all the yeah. time. Yeah. 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 Donovan the Dirtbiker. I think he resting in peace now. Oh, really? I, I haven't yes, heard sir. that. But you know what? Me and High C recorded half of our album there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we had a great time, man. Like, uh, you know, Dre, Easy and them would leave, and then we would go in, because we had to rent block time back then. Mm-hmm. So, but Donovan was giving us, like, $75 an hour, but it had to be, like, 10 hours. So, but it was a good deal, though. We finished it, and we got a good sound out of that. And studios used to cost like a mother. Hell yeah. <laughs> That's why I couldn't everybody... the days of the big budgets, and big man. budgets for videos. And all you know that. what I say, A, though? Yeah. You know what was good about that? was that people had to be serious about their craft. You couldn't just say, I'm going to go be a rapper, because there was an entry point. Right. If you didn't have no producer or the homie that had the four tracks in his garage or the eight track, you had to kick in some money. And even then, messing with the homies, in some cases, yeah, you had to I, kick I, in some I, money. I started in the garage with the I was just going to say, we started from the garage. Two turntables and just making, making tapes, just uh, rapping over, like, 
Like they call mixtapes today. That's mm-hmm. how we was doing it back then. Yeah. Rapping over niggas' beats and just shit. Yeah, it was a different era. Back that was then. the time where we used to, you know, stop the tape, rewind it back. Mm. Stop the doing the pause tapes. With pause tapes. Mm. You know, that was that was that was an experience though. Putting the pause tapes. I'm gonna ask each of y'all a question. This includes you two, eight. When you first start doing this as a little kid, man, because everybody start with the same vision. You just fall in love. You ain't thinking about getting paid. You ain't thinking about none of that. You just like, I'm going to be an MC. I'm going to rap. I'm going to be a DJ. Did you ever think that you would achieve the things that you did? I'm sorry, what was that again? Did you ever think that you would achieve the things that you achieved? No. And I will tell you why. Um, you know, I started popping, and I thought I was pretty good, and then breaking came in, and I thought I was pretty good, but I was just too damn tall for breaking. Mm-hmm. So, so when I started DJing was pretty much when I got introduced to uh, when I saw Joe Cooley spin. Uh, back in the day, and he was spinning Let's Work. He was doing Do What Diddy. He was doing And the Beat Goes On by Orbit. He was cutting it up. I knew that's what I wanted to do at that moment, mm-hmm. you know. And I actually got really, really good. I never became a KD Mix Master. And now that I'm today that I'm close to Tony G, I tell him, like, bro, I always wanted to be a KD Mix Master. I just didn't know how to go about it, mm-hmm. you know. But to answer your question, Steve Yano, the, the, the Swamp Me vendor from the city of Whittier, the Japanese man, He's the one that pretty much opened the door for me. And I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him because he knew everybody. He introduced me to Violet Brown and uh, uh, happy birthday to her because her birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday, Violet. Yeah. For those that don't know, Violet Brown was a pivotal piece. It's the pivotal piece in West Coast history. She was the buyer for warehouse music and always had an open door policy with everybody. Yes. So he introduced me to her, he introduced me to Dre, uh, Steve introduced me to Easy Jinx. My very first record that I ever did scratching on was for uh, Jinx, produced a record for a rapper named Dazzy D. And uh, mm-hmm. they were signed to Kelvin Anderson, much love and respect to him, the owner of VIP Records. Mm-hmm. So that was in 1987, and we recorded that at Echo Sound. That was the first, first time I met Pooh and uh, I met uh, King T. Mm-hmm. Uh, the engineer there was Vacek. And um, I, that was my first record that I ever did scratching on. So I knew I was on my way up because of Steve. He introduced me to everyone. And then when he bought me my first SP-1200, SP-1200 uh, drum machine, I didn't know how to use it. The, the, you know, the manual was like this big, like a damn phone book. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he just told me, I'll take you to Dre's. And I was just like, you're gonna take me to Dre? Now I didn't know that Dre was, didn't really have no money at the time. Mm-hmm. We went to his apartment in Paramount. Michelet opens the door. I walk in with my turntable. He was gonna teach me how to sample. And he had nothing in his apartment. So I asked him, like, how long have you been living here? And he said, like, six months. Why? And I was like, okay, because you don't even have a table. And he goes, no, just put it on the floor. So we put it on the floor, and we both laid down, and he was laying down next to me. He was like, put the record. Here, here's the volume. Here's how you sample. Here's how you truncate. Uh, um, this has 10 seconds, 2.5 seconds per each sample. You're going to have to put that record on 45, then slow it down here, then uh, record, get your tempo, and, and I have a photographic memory, so I was able to remember everything. Uh, That's crazy. So uh, you learned how to program an SB-1200 laying on the floor in the apartment in Paramount with Dr. Dre. I learned how to program an MPC by just watching Slip. Yeah. I didn't read no manual or none of that shit. That's I, how I kind of was, just, just being him, around the studio. I watched them nigga and just went and bought one one day and said, fuck it. I'm finna go for broke. That's how you teach yourself shit. I learned some shit, but I didn't want to do that shit. Yeah, yeah. And Coco, did you ever think you would achieve, or did you ever think you'd be the most featured nigga in hip hop, the most nah, featured man in hip hop? Nah, I wasn't thinking like that. You know, I I had to work because they wouldn't play my name on the radio. You know, and it was kind of tough for me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But you know, um, when Easy E passed, that was our lifeline to the game. And then all the assets got frozen and all that. So nine times out of 10, I go to the studio and for some reason people like the style Mm. and it just kept going and snowballing and I just didn't stop. Mm -hmm. Then when I looked up, you know, wifey had said, uh, do you know how many features you know? I said, nah, I didn't think about that. She said, I said, now I'm thinking about that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, from A-list artists to uh, major artists, I was always working, you know, um, the Chicanos, 
you know, doing a lot of stuff with Chicano brothers that, you know, put food on the table, period. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I enjoy doing what I'm doing. Sometimes it was good, sometimes it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But I love music, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I tell anybody, it's cool to, to make some snaps, but you got to love what you do or don't do it at all. It's I real. just love what I did, and plus, you know, putting the food on the table was everything. You know what I'm saying? So I look years later, and I'm glad those doors shut in my face because they didn't want to play cocaine on the radio. Easy E died, but it was in me and not on me. I had to work. You don't work, you don't eat. Mm -hmm. I just kept working because the money was good. You know, and sometimes it wasn't, you know, but then again, you know, and I'm grateful for every moment that I was able to endure all these years and never did stop for the last 35 years. So, you know, I'm here years later being the most future recording artist in the world, and it's cool. You know, it's something primarily to, you know, give to my, the legacy to my family. Mm -hmm. But then also, you know, years later, I look at all the influence and it's just surreal. I dope. never did talk that. That's dope. You know what? I was going to ask you, man. You did a record, man, because you don't work with pretty much everybody. Right. It ain't nobody that you haven't worked with. I heard you on a record with Puff. Right. Of all right. people, with all the stuff he going to through. Yeah, yeah, I had to, man. I had to. It's just your yeah. ass. When you was in that studio, was you in the studio with Puff when y'all did that record? Well, um, I went out there to Miami. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, uh, rest in peace, Donnie from 6 -0, he was uh, – my manager. So he hooked it up, you know, Diddy had called, uh, I, I kind of, this ain't Diddy, hung up and then Donnie called me back and said, yeah, it's Diddy. So Diddy has been a, a fan of bars of all the long cocaine, him and Notorious B.I.G. for mm -hmm. many moons. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, B.I.G. got his style from King T, so they love West Coast. Mm -hmm. Yep, true. Mm -hmm. So when I went out there, it was all cool. It was laid out. And I was like, oh, that's cool. So we went to his little small island, and I ain't seen nothing next to it. It was, it was cold in. That's what I was going to ask you, man. It wasn't no, it wasn't yeah, no pink. Ready. It yeah, wasn't he, no pink cavity there? Yeah, he no. ready to see it, some shit. Faith Evans was there. She was married to a, somebody from Compton at that time. The home Hold on. Faith had a, was married to somebody from Compton? Yeah. Yeah. So he was out there, right? Mm -hmm. And it was cool. So he said, we're going to the studio later that night. So we get to the studio. He's jamming, playing all the new stuff, you know, doing his little dancing and shit. So, so he really be dancing, the animating yeah, and shit, dancing, doing all that but stuff. But he was being, he was being. All right, yeah. go on, bust a move, nah. nigga. You want to right now? Yeah. Look at it. Hey, <laughs> it, it, it never <laughs> dawned on shake it, his shoulders. It never shit. dawned on me, you know. He was being cool, like you cool, like oh, you cool. Everybody in there cool. So I do my work, and he's like impressed and shit. You know, I did, sometimes I, I'm lonely. Mm -hmm. He said, we're going to this poppy club tonight. I said, okay. So I hop in the whip with him, nice little car. I, the dude pull out a tray full of ecstasy. It's no bullshit. And it's, you know, everybody knows, so it's a story. So I'm just telling the story. I said, no, nah, I don't want none. So we go to the club and on the first floor, you know, it's cold, everybody chilling. Second second floor is cold, everybody chilling. When we get up to the third floor, it's kind of different. It hit different. This dude over there doing something to that dude. This dude over there doing something to that dude. And we are in a round circle with bottles and shit. I didn't get nothing to drink either. I looked at this nigga so cold like this. Hey, Coco, talk, Coco, talk to the mic. <laughs> like, Look at he get like, me that shit. I was like, motherfucker, if you don't get me, I had that look. Like, nickel. He seen I went with the program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he dropped me off immediately, and I didn't see him no more. Next day, I was on the airplane, got my chalupas, and that was that. And I always kept that story to myself. You know what I'm saying? I just start sharing it because, you know, anybody do trafficking or whatever they ask you, green, purple, blue, you know, because everybody, everybody say, especially us as people, they say, we always want to tear the black man down, the black man down. No. What he did, it ain't cool. You know what I'm saying? But that's his business between him and God. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But that was my experience, you know, with, with Mr. Diddy. Yeah, I'm, you know what? I feel kind of vindicated because I was telling them about that. You know, they say he was getting something like pink cocaine, pink cocoa, pink cavy from the girl, Young Miami or whatever it was, right? Remember I told you about that Hollywood party I went to when they came out there with a tray and they had some pink some pink powder on it? Yeah, you and them parties, man. And I was like, man, what the is hell is that? And I wasn't, hell no, not with him. Yeah, yeah. I was at some weird shit, though, and they had some pink yeah, powder like on the motherfucking thing, tray. Parties. And I was like, damn, what the hell is that? But I, I got the hell on. So what do you think? Is it the, is it the money to just make a motherfucker get weird? Is it What is it? What is it? I believe, man, and y'all can elaborate if y'all want to. I believe that's already in them. I was just going to say But that. they don't have the opportunity to flex like that yeah. because when you a regular dude, you can't do all that. You just can't order stuff. You just can't, oh, I'm going to go buy this. You know, I'm going to do this, do that. But when you get that paper, it allows you, you know, to start experiencing have, stuff a little yeah, different. You would have took a trip to the island, the little island, to go do a beat. Man, you know what? Probably so, but I wouldn't have been with none of the other stuff. But the, you know, you pop one of them ecstasy, how nigga hopping around like my nigga from Colors <laughs> oh. with the ears yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, nah, I, would. I wouldn't have been with that. Hey, look, look, <laughs> it, it, it was cool until, you know, that situation, but I didn't judge him. I got my motherfucking bread. I won't check so it. to elaborate, up, he took you to the final level. He took you to the final level of the matrix. He took me to the floor. upper room. My nigga the upper room. He took you to the upper echelon. Yeah, yeah the upper, upper room. echelon. <laughs> and what was he doing? Was he in there dancing? What, what was he? Out. Like, I'm just want to know, like, did nah, he go to the nah, table? we were sitting at a table. It was bottles. And... I just felt uncomfortable, honey. I would have felt uncomfortable you too. Know, I'm, uh, you know, no disrespect against any communities, but I'm a full heterosexual, bro. And I don't get down like that. You know what I'm saying? I seen that and it made me uncomfortable and I wasn't out there for that weirdo shit. I was out there to get my bread and handle my business. And I handled my business and say, La B. Yeah. Now years later, we all seeing this shit happen. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, that, you know, it's unfortunate and sad, but a lot of that shit, he's just one out of many that's about to be exposed. Oh, yeah. You're going to be surprised Go this year. Who's going, you're going to be surprised this year who's going to get exposed because, you know, there's such thing as a God and there's such thing as paying the piper from Satan. So when Satan get done with your ass, he's going to say, come here. He ain't, the, he ain't the only one, but I did hear from no. one of the homies, and I ain't going to put his name out there, but he used to work for Suge. He told me a long time ago, he said, man, Puff, 10 times worse than Suge ever was. Right. He said, so y'all, he said, you ain't seen nothing, dog. He said, no, that dude ain't innocent like you think he is. He said, and he he ain't going to no details with me, but he told me that, you know, Tony, it's a lot of stuff going on right now. I mean, you was having a conversation the other day. You know, they say they accusing Puffy of some freaky stuff, you know, being a freak pretty much, you know what I mean? And But it's stuff that goes way deeper you feel what I'm saying? It ain't cool. It's satanic. Yeah, it's satanic. It's demonic. And there's, there's all kind of shit going on to cut you off. We ain't going to sit there at the table and act like we don't know what's going on. Oh, it's a lot going on. The, the biggest thing I was talking with the homie about the other day was the trend, because one of the things Cassie accused Puff of was getting, getting other men to have, you know, six, you know, relationships with her right. while he watched. That's weirdo shit. And it's like, that's a big trend right now. Me and you, me and you was talking about yeah. that. It's yeah. a real trend now to where dudes is going out and getting cats to go mess with their wives while they sit there and look. Yeah. I, like, that's, I mean, that's weird to but, me, man. But, but look, it's and not... The references has been going back for a while when you see these weird, rich, old motherfuckers who couldn't get it up no more, and they sit in a hidden room while they wife, you know, fuck a nigga, and then they be sitting in the hidden room, you know, watching and shit or filming. Yeah, it's been going on for many months. It's been going on for a while, so, you know, uh, like I said, I don't know what what, uh, category or or, um, what criteria of people be, you know, when, like you say, a motherfucker just say uh, enough ain't enough, and they got to take it shit to... To different levels of whatever. It's like, just take that, take that, yeah, take that. Again, take that. again, that goes to my saying. Uh, we got people in this world who just don't know how to be normal. 
you get me? Yeah, yeah. That, that that's be that, that, but that's crazy and though. I, like you said, I don't know if like a motherfucker it was hidden, nigga did some freaky shit when he was in school as a kid. Right. Who knows what the motherfucker used to do? But the coldest thing Dress around up it, in mom's clothes when yeah. she was gone. Who knows? You get me, uh, motherfucker. You, you, and and that's why I say, is it the money that that makes them feel comfortable to where, you know. I can do all this motherfucking secret, eyes wide shut, got my own community with a masquerade mask on and men all in the corner freaking on each other because I feel like I'm at the status to where I rub shoulders with with certain people. Yeah, the upper echelon. I'm, up, I'm untouchable. You and they've me? been that. I'm going to tell you, that wasn't, I believe anyone is living that hedonistic lifestyle, bro. It's always been on their mind, but they didn't have the chips to execute the game plan. Not the chips. It's anything. It's anything can happen. Right. You know, me and you was having a conversation yeah. the other day, right? We ain't going to put no, you yeah. know, because you ain't even tell me no names. I didn't ask no names. But you've had people proposition you. Yeah. And uh, also, I've had dudes tell me stories. Uh, for an example, see that guy over there? Yeah, that guy paid me to fuck his wife. Like, for real? Yeah. And you did it? Yeah. What did he do? He just sat there and watched. And it's been a trend for a while. Dudes, you know, have pretty much told me stories. Oh, yeah, I was with his wife. I was with his wife. And then after a while, it almost seemed like a, like a common thing, you know. And the reason why that thing really tripped me out is because I, I want to say this. I got out of the music industry in 2002, and I didn't come back till. 2017 so I really missed like 15 years of music so when I came back and I started this podcast to promote my documentary mm -hmm. uh, everything just started hitting me like people started telling me story where you been man this has been going on man this has been going on this and then when I started hearing stories I'm like this motherfucking world got weirder I mean I was working at Rouse uh, local 572 I was a teamster for uh, uh, Kroger who owns Rouse and the city of Compton right there where Wilmington and the 91 is and uh, I was there for 15 years, man. And uh, I didn't listen, really listen to no music. I didn't want nothing to do with the music industry because I, the music industry got weird. And uh, uh, the business side of it just turned me off. Mm -hmm. So when I came back, it was like new to me all over again. You know, I, I thought for me to promote my documentary, I had to buy an ad in the newspaper, buy an ad in a magazine or buy a, a bus stop or something. They said, no, it's all social media. So when I got on there, to my surprise, okay, Certain females started hitting me up. So I knew certain females from a long time, and I was like, hey, who is that person? They, they keep you know, sending me messages. Don't message him back. And I go, him? Yeah, that's rapper so-and-so. He's pretending to be a girl to get nude pics from a dude. And I didn't know that that existed. Oh, wow. So what it, they call that shit, catfishing? Yeah. yeah. So it's a dude. Well, it's a setup, yeah. sounds like. Motherfucker gonna pretend to be a bitch yeah. to, and, and get to flirting with you and woop de woop, nigga, I'm gonna give you some pussy, nigga, nigga, send me some of them pics. And then you send the motherfucker some pics and then they turn around, nigga, you better slide me some bread before I let everybody. See, I never it. understood that cat sending them pics out anyway. You, you feel what I'm saying? Like, like what is that? Well, let, let me say this. Nigga ain't gonna catch you ass naked. So oh, no, you, 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 you ain't, ain't no pics of me out there, nowhere. <laughs> so, so what happened was, I found out later, <laughs> later on, that those guys that were acting like females were really into that. They were really into dudes, but they didn't want to come out and say, you know, I'm a dude and can I see you naked? So let me pretend I'm a girl so I can get off on you sending me pics. Man, ain't glad you normal. I'm glad to be normal as a motherfucker, dog. Because I'm listening to this stuff all the time, you know. Because you glad to be normal. We have to have. I believe in God first and foremost, man. And when you make a vow before God that you go marry this woman, you can't treat her like a toss-up, dog. Hell no. You can't treat her like a toss-up. That's the mother of your kids. That's your wife. That's your soulmate. Yeah. That's supposed to be all. You, any, if anything. Her messing with the, another dude supposed to send you into a fit of rage. You feel what I mean? Right. I think that, that, like everybody said, I think it's been around for a minute. It's just, you know, the internet exposes it and put it on steroids now. And I don't knock nobody. You know, I got to put my disclaimer out there. You know, I got, 
I don't care what nobody do in the privacy of their bedroom, whatever floats your boat. And if you and your husband cool with it, it ain't none of my business. Right. But I just think it's a lot of weird stuff going on. And me and Glass is always getting arguments because I tell them about certain people in the industry mm-hmm. that you might look up to. And I say, bro, no, nah, no, nah, you know, this dude, man, no, nah, still, you lying. You lying. How you know, man? I'm telling you, I just know. Some stuff you just know. You feel what I'm saying? Well, let, let me drop this one on you. I know a, a lowrider car show uh, model from years ago, and I think, I won't say her name, but I believe you know who she is. I'll tell you guys after. Yeah, you know who she is because he started yeah. laughing as soon as you said it. Well, she's been my friend for a long time. She was on my I'm Not Your Puppet video, okay? So I'll leave that clue. She was dating this one boxer, a real wealthy boxer. I'll name him after as well. And uh, she told me, because she, she would always talk to me. She goes, oh, I went to this club with him. And I said, really? She goes, and we were sitting down at a booth. It was him and then another guy. And I dropped my purse. So when I bent down to grab my purse, I looked. And he was holding hands like this with that dude. He goes, so I said, you know what? I'll be back. I'm going to go take a walk around. And then she started naming everybody that she saw there. And I said, what kind of club was this? She goes, it was a gay club. Hmm. She named rappers that I looked up to that were there. So when she went up to him, because she knew them because of me, what are you doing here? Oh, we just come here to network. Network, for sure. Yeah, they just trying to network, network their ass into some yeah. free shit. I, I, I met some record executives that wanted to sign some of the groups that I was working with. I'm all fucking with you tonight, still. That, that would tell me, oh, yeah, that rapper and that rapper, they come over to sleep over all the time. I cook them breakfast. That's what I'm saying. What's this thing about grown men spending the night over each other's house like they little kids? There's a lot of freaky shit going on in this motherfucker tonight, dog. God, hey, you done silenced me in this episode, man. You got me, also, yeah, I'm just quiet as a church mouth with you. Be <laughs> oh, man, we, we, we gonna be off of this. We gonna be off. <laughs> yeah, what's up? What about the way they rated him, though? Y'all think that was necessary with the tanks and the AKs and all that shit? Yeah, with because you know, Brian, he, he loved doing that. So I'm gonna repeat that for, for those who might not have heard it. Do you think that they were overboard with the way they came at Diddy? Nah, it's deeper than that. It's, I'm telling you. It's, it's uh, what's that dude? Uh, Epstein, Epstein, Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, yeah, it's on some shit like that. Oh yeah, for sure. I heard he was the. I heard Puffy is the plug, man. Yeah, and he, he started he probably the Black Epstein. Yeah, when you get when when you get accusations, you know, because motherfuckers, you know, they don't want to go the the regular court route because you know they won't go the civil route. I want to be able to give me some bread, but. Motherfuckers is kick. They peeping everything that's going on in the civil case, and now they reading shit like what this nigga said. This happened, and what this and that, and whatever. So now they like nigga. We need to jump in here and see what's what's going. I'll tell you there. the truth, me and my boy Patch was talking. I think R. Kelly is spilling the beans on everybody. You know he might be. He might He's be like, like y'all wasn't there for me. Yeah. <laughs> Sammy the bull your ass. <laughs> it's, it's it's like I said, it was try it was it was a money, it was a money play. You get me? Mother cause motherfuckers who felt like if he paid her off, I I I, I done seen a few things. So let me go. But see by then once he done gave out the first check, now he feeling like, you know. All the mother niggas is small potatoes. I got rid of, you know, right. I paid off the big fish. Mm-hmm. So anybody else come say some shit, I'ma just deny, deny. You know what I think happened, man? I think I always tell people, be careful how you treat people on the way up. Mm-hmm. Because see, it's one thing to fall off this table. It's a whole nother thing to fall off this roof. So the bigger you are, the harder your fall is gonna be, right? And I think he pissed somebody off, dog. He, he pissed, pissed homegirl off, had her doing all that freaky deaky shit. Not just, you said, I'm going to get my bread for all not that. Not just her. Weird you know, shit. Luke saying, I was hearing the homie Luke, shout out to the homeboy Luther Campbell. Mm-hmm. He was talking about, you know, the, um, what was the brand he had? What was the, um, the, the Ciroc, the people from Ciroc, the company? You know, he was involved in a lawsuit with them or whatever, and he accused them of being racist. And some people ain't, you know, when you get to just drag and trying to drag certain people that got money, dog, they'll put you in your place real quick. Yeah, you know, you become a liability, bro, and then you figure, like you said, he might have been involved with that Epstein dude. 
Because, you know, when they put out that list of those people that were going to that island, they had a lot of people's names on that list. Crazy. And, and I don't know what they're doing. I don't like talking about Jay and Beyonce because I don't know their business. I don't know their household. You feel what I mean? Mm. They seem like normal people, but their names is on that list, bro. Yeah. If a dude is in, my thing is this, dogs hang with dogs. You don't never see a, a, a pack of cats and dogs running the street together. You see dogs running together. You see stray cats running together. You feel what I mean? Mm. If you got a motherfucker that's doing real hedonistic shit and just on some next level perversion shit, and you hanging out with him and you see people with him, more than likely they into the same shit. Right. That's all I'm gonna say. I don't know, I'm not here, you know, I'm not trying to get no clicks by <laughs> throwing Jay's name out there, but it was a lot of people on that list, man. And I think that people really, I think people really be selling their souls, man. Oh yeah. People be really selling their souls, you know, I I'ma tell you. That's that hidden curtain class, you get mm -hmm. me? You know how you go somewhere and it's the hidden curtain and you can't go back there because you on, you ain't on the list, you ain't a member. You. That's that. That's that class, man. You yeah, that's that, that special you don't club. Get to cross that rope, man. Mm -hmm. Behind that rope and that curtain, nigga, there's some wild shit going on. You don't want to go behind the green door. You don't want to go behind there still. No, mm -hmm. not at all, man. Just a peek. No, I don't even want to peek, bro. <laughs> Just I peek don't your even, head in for. A I don't even want to peek my <laughs> head in for a minute. Not for no amount of money. Not for no type of fame or popularity. Like you, you had like uh -huh. two hundred. You had like two, three hundred million. You wouldn't be. You wouldn't have you a small island. Oh no, bro. running around with weird shit on. No. Playing like you back in Africa, just for just running. No, I'm cool. I'm gonna tell you, what's the dude's name? Because you had got into producing films and stuff, right? Yes. You got into producing because you produced the Romeo documentary. What's the guy's name that produced the Will Smith, um, the Fresh Pence of Bel Air, and a lot of these TV shows? Uh, Benny Medina. Benny Medina. Now, you always have to follow the certain trail of stuff. Every rapper that got cracking in the 80s that went broke and got a TV show, you ever notice they went big? Yeah. Anybody that's messing with Benny Medina that went big? It's a such thing as selling your soul for fame, dog. Right. For popularity. Because I'm not going to put names. The people go do their own research for what I'm saying. Yeah. But, but you had big rappers going broke in the early days of hip-hop. You know, they making a making million dollars. They kids, though, and then they broke, right? Right. So you get this dude to offer them an opportunity. Hey, man, I'm going to put you on TV. I'm going to give you a couple million dollars, put you back up, but you got to do this, this, and that. These people do the this, this, and that because it's already in them. Yeah. And they may have been doing it before. You feel what I'm saying? Or may not have had the thing or maybe have been in denial about who they were. You feel what I mean? Right. Or they may not be that way, but they just there for the pay. You feel what I'm saying? It's a lot of wicked stuff that goes on, man. And um, I ain't just gonna say Hollywood, but just in just in that world, dog, where it's millions of dollars and being, you know, spent around, they can just press buttons and make stuff happen. Right. Like, 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 um, I say it's like a motherfucker who start off smoking some stress weed and he keep excelling because it ain't never enough. And now you know a nigga shooting needles up and doing all kind of weird shit because the high just ain't enough. You need, I right. need to get higher. That's them motherfuckers. That's them, bro, they get that. Some normal pussy or some normal uh, dick or whatever, that, that ain't enough. I need a motherfucker running around here in a rabbit suit, nigga, with his asshole out and nigga sniffing cocaine off his balls or some weird shit. Oh, man, I'm gonna tell you, one of the homies, man, that's a bodyguard, right? I've been trying to get him to come on the show, dog. He won't do it, dog. I ain't even gonna say his name, put him out there. He told me, man, he was working, and I can't say the names of the people because he gonna get the trip. I'm like, still, you talking too much. But he said he was working for this one individual that's a sports icon. Mm -hmm. Hell, own NFL team. He said that he was doing some work for him, and he said, you know, he got in, he was like one of the top, you know, guards, so he's in the house. And then at the night, he said, man, Every Friday night, man, it would be a motherfucker come in there in a costume, like, you know, get dressed up like Fred Flintstone uh -huh. and knock this dude's wife down. Like, put on the whole Fred Flintstone cartoon. Fred, well, it's just Mom. a lot of weird stuff, man. It's a lot of weird, crazy stuff, I man. Told, that's I told, that's that, 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 that rope, that curtain. You want to go behind there, man. Stay on this side, man. 
Be no, it's okay to be normal. It's okay, and I'm cool with being an average vanilla motherfucker. <laughs> I'm I'm cool. I'm cool with being average. So Tony, you and Croft is doing your thing. You produced that whole album. You and him both, yes, didn't you? Uh, except two songs. Quick did the other two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, but that's how we started. Now keep in mind, and I do want to say this because. I was just a mixtape guy. I didn't know anything about production. Absolutely nothing. So when we did I'm Not Your Puppet, that was Steve's idea. He said, Tone, let's do an original song to put on a mixtape for High C. I didn't know anything about production. I had a Newmark mixer that had a sampler. So I just sampled the bar. I I remember I sampled like Impeach the President. Mm -hmm. And then I threw it on my four-track Porta 1 task cam. Then I got the record, I'm Not Your Puppet, it's a four-bar loop, so the SP-12 is not going to sample that. So I had to ride that motherfucker on time, stop, go back, go to another track, you know, on time. That's crazy. For about four minutes. Mm-hmm. High C comes over, and he's just freestyling some bullshit, some funny shit. And Steve said, that's dope, let's go with that. And I was like, we're just fucking around. No, let's go with that. All right, cool, whatever. So we put it on the mixtape, and I remember that mixtape so like fucking hotcakes at the rodeum. He would pay me like 200 bucks per mixtape, so we would do once, one every month because we had allowed new music to come out. Mm-hmm. So, um, so he said, that one's so really good, let's do another one. So I just flipped the records over and sit in the park where Billy Stewart was on there. I just sampled Substitution, my Newmark mixer, dropped it again, he did the fucking lyrics. So and then, uh, I still remember the guy's name, Stuart Cohen, he worked for, uh, uh, Disney, they had just opened up a record label called Hollywood Records. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they, I remember that. So, I remember Stuart. Yeah. So, so they come to, um, to the Rhodium, and they pretty much, they show Steve the tape, and he goes. It was Chuck and Stewart. Was that I believe name? so, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So he says, um, who did this tape? And Steve said, uh, he did it, and he pointed at me. Mm-hmm. And we always thought it was people going to bust us for uh, selling bootlegs. Mm-hmm. So he pointed at your ass and said, he the one that did that shit. Yes, and then I said, yeah, but he sells them, uh-huh. you know. So he said, no, no, I'm looking for that guy right here. It says, hi, C, because I named the, the tape after him. And I, he goes, I'm looking for him. We just opened up a new record label, and we're looking to sign him. You know, this got dropped into my lap at the office. So I said, well, I could take you to him. So we went, and uh, the weirdest part, bro, we didn't hear from that dude's ass, from his ass for like six months, bro. By that time, my mom had kicked me out. I was like curb serving. I was just a nickel and diamond, bro. So she found what little dope I had, what little money I had, and she kicked me out. I had a tank top, I had a broken wrist, some green Ben Davis, and some Nike Cortez, and I was just staying from house to house. Then one of my homeboys hits me up, and he goes, hey, Steve, call me. He's in Florida, and uh, he wants to talk to you tonight. He's going to call me in about an hour. He wanted me to find you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, for what? And he says, I don't know. He wants to talk to you. So this was on a Friday, I believe. So we go to his house. Steve calls me from Florida. I'm flying in over the weekend. Hollywood Records wants to meet us on Monday. And I was like, for what? He want to give us a record deal. A record deal? He goes, remember that guy that came to the Swami? And I go, yeah, that guy wants to give us a record deal. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, like, does that involve money? And he was like, yeah. He want to give us 40000 for a single and then 100000 for the album if the single sells good. So I was like... All, all right then, but I don't have a ride over there. Don't worry, I'll pick you up. So we came all the way from Whittier to Wilmington to Burbank. And then that's when we met, and that's the first day I actually even met Funkin' Klein. You guys remember Funkin' Klein? Uh-huh. Rest in peace, Funkin' Klein. He opened up Hollywood Basic at, at Disney. So they signed us, and then that's how I started. That's how I was forced to become a producer, and I knew nothing about producing. So I just started learning how to sample. And it, the, the crazy part about that record was this, that... It was my first time out. I thought I was experimenting. I gave him my best, and we ended up getting a gold record. Wow. Yeah, that's how it usually happens. You know, I wanted to ask you, did y'all ever go back and do that puppet? The, y'all obviously did the um, I'm Your Puppet record over again. Yes. Because you got different skills now at this point, so I'm pretty sure you wanted to go clean that motherfucker up, you know? You, you know what? The reason why we never did, because it was clean in the very beginning. Let me tell you why. When so that's, we, so, so that's a, not to just cut you off, but yeah. that's the same record? That's the same record. Yeah. That's crazy, yeah. man. The, the reason why, because we took it and I told Donovan, uh, uh, I go, bro, I don't know how to sample this, um, this eight, four bar loop of uh, I'm Your Puppet. So if you remember, he had the SB12 keyboard. Remember that yeah, one? Yeah, It was on the couch. Mm-hmm. And uh, he goes, I'll just sample that on here. So he sampled a full four bar. 
and he just threw it on, on the two inch, and he just kept repeating it. He was already working on computer. He had a computer. Yeah, he had already a computer back then. Back then in the eighties, and he sampled it, and uh, you know, I mean, that's how that happened. And then we did sitting in the park there. We did a song called Jack Move, and then they released a single. And but Hollywood Records really experimented with our record because they had a bunch of college kids working at that label. First, they released a single of a puppet, and then he took it off, and then they released a Maxi single, and then he took it off. And we were traveling, bro, traveling on a promotional tour, uh, you know, uh, performing our songs, and none of our, the, the record stores had our, had our music, bro. That's crazy. I used to hate when that, that shit happened. happened. That happened. That happened a few times. Yeah. You go to record stores, and they wouldn't have your product or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, just bad marketing, yeah. bad promotion, man. You piss a motherfucker off, so... Obviously, y'all doing y'all job, though. Yes. The good thing is that we took a camcorder and we would walk in that store and say, do you have the High C featuring Tony A album? Who's that? Everywhere. Atlanta, Philadelphia, Detroit, everywhere. So we would come back giving the videotapes. And then they would tell us, what was the name of those stores so we could make sure they get them? I'm like, what the fuck? They, we had a WIA distribution. And those record stores, they didn't even have it. Now, they're not putting them records out there. Yeah. Just, just... The, the moms and pops is not ordering them because they don't know shit about them. And then the motherfucking consumers, we don't know nothing about no local yeah. dudes from, you know. You went through the eight? Sometimes. Even as big as your records was? Uh, sometimes. I would go to, you know, maybe later on in my career, I would go to record stores and they wouldn't have product, you know. I, I will say this. I never met eight back then, but... I was always a big fan because my favorite song today is still This Is Compton. Mm. When, the, when that beat kicked in, doom, 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 doom. That, when that, shit, that beat kicked in, fuck, I used to always cut, that sh- cut it up. But when me and Crawford, High C, started traveling, everywhere we used to go, oh, eight was here last week. Damn, I missed them. Eight was here last week. Oh, as a matter of fact, you were, we were there the week after. It was in Houston, Texas at a place called the Palladium. Yeah, and I still have our fly. I keep everything, bro. And uh, everywhere we went. We're on massive promo tours, man. Epic used to send me all over the country on a promo tour. I hated that shit. Yeah. I used to ask a slip it about was you. a way to uh, promote the record, but really didn't benefit from the shit. As far Promotion. as Fred was concerned, <laughs> shit. Okay, so You'd promo be all tour over the that. country. Yeah. Promote and selling records and motherfuckers lied up outside to get autographs. Nigga, you get home, nigga, you broke as a motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Like, damn, nigga, these records selling, where's the bread? <laughs> <laughs> that business and that publishing shit was no yeah. joke. That shit, that man. I mean, you, $50, you, $100 per diem. Did you go through the same shit, Coco? So, yeah. And I'm and pretty sure we we'll make a record out mm-hmm. back then belonging to a Sony or whatever. Nigga, you go on the road, you be in, just moving around. Mm-hmm. Nigga, you get home, record all over the place, videos out, and nigga, royalty check. What? There wasn't no, because the cost ate up all that. Man. Yeah. 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 They start spinning out them expenditures where you owe this, owe this, and then the check look like. Nigga, five dollars. We had a conversation about you last week. It was two hours. Nigga, that cost. Yeah. That cost money. Everybody else getting paid because you got to remember, they charging y'all back out y'all little percentage that y'all yeah. getting. Mm-hmm. Nigga, they, charge they might be right. making six, seven dollars over here, but no, that's that's ours right here. Oh, yeah, you man, have, you man, ain't recoup. We had to mail that contract over to your lawyer's office. Yeah, man, that cost you for the stamps and yeah. shit. Yeah. We charge. All right, man. Nigga, every time we had a courier, when we was negotiating the deal and the courier was taking the contract back and forth, mm. nigga, we charged for that. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. That's crazy as a motherfucker. Oh, you came up here and had a meeting and had a meal and some lunch and all that shit? Mm-hmm. $10,000. We charged you for that shit. $10,000. They eating good off of y'all, so... Y'all do this one album, man. It's going good. Yeah. Why didn't you and Crawford? I always wanted to ask you this, and I never asked, because you know how I see is a good friend of mine. I'm pretty sure you yes. know that. Yes. Why didn't y'all keep shit going, man? Okay. You want to know the truth or you want me to lie to you? 
I want the truth, man. This is this is yeah, the truth. We, we we deal in truth. Okay, uh, I only share this one other time. I, I did two interviews with Soren Baker, and uh, on the second one, I expressed this. Now it's all love with me and Crawford today. Okay, but back then I kind of want to blame it on that maybe he was young, you know, because he was young when he wrote a lot of those songs. He was 16 years old, and um, so I was notified by. Uh, A&R by a lady named Rachel Matthews and she hit me up and told me hey for their second album uh, we're going to need you to step to the side and I said uh, why, why what happened and he goes well and she now Crawford denied it okay but she goes well he doesn't want you to be a part of this record anymore you know now we were signed as artists we weren't signed as a group mm -hmm. so and um I said, okay, so what do you want me to do? She goes, well, I'll give you some remixes to make. They had just signed Queen, so I was doing remixes, you know, for Queen and other stuff. And, um, you know, I, I, felt, I felt fucked up, I'll be honest with you. Be, you know, be, because, wow. because when I met him, I met him at the Swamp Meet. So y'all got a deal together. Yes. Y'all signed the Hollywood record deal together. Yes, yes. And what happened was, you know, we met at the Swami. I, I put him on the mixtapes, you know, and that's what got his name out there. We ended up getting signed because of that production that I did on those mixtapes. And then to be told later on, you know, he doesn't want you uh, on this record, you know. So I was like, all right, cool, then fuck. I got us here, and now I'm getting the boot, you know. So I was like, all right, cool, whatever. Frost said he didn't say that, right? I, I, he, he told me he didn't say that, okay? You know what, me knowing Frost, and this ain't me defending him, but I think he'd have probably told you that himself. Like, Croft ain't a foul dude. Like, right. No, I, I don't think he is. But I will say this, that during that time, he never even talked to me. As a matter of fact, they gave him like who a... Who produced the next record? Uh, um, he did half. He had like maybe like 12 songs. And they gave him like a $240,000 like uh, um, budget. So Rachel Matthews calls me and tells me maybe like months later, she said, hey, listen, he's turned in all his record. And we're just not feeling it. We're, we're actually, you know, giving him advance on royalties now because he wasted all the money. So we want you to come back in and produce, you know, so, some songs. So I said, you're going to have to talk to my manager, which was Steve at the time. Because I didn't want to deal with her. And because she's the one that told me the so-called bad news, you know. Mm -hmm. So Steve goes, what do you want? And I just said, I want, for six songs, I want $60,000. And I want to sell all my publishing and I want another 60000 and he said, okay. Well, they didn't give me 60 for the publishing, they just gave me 30. So I made a good chunk of change. I produced the songs, he okayed them. I told Steve, I don't want him in there when I'm tracking them. Uh, I'll just produce them and I'll leave. And I did, that's how, how it happened. And then uh, I get a call the night before the video shoot for a song called Got It Like That, that I produced. And my, my song was going to be the first single. Wait, it was the first single. He said, I just wanted to let you know, bro, did I see ever call you? And I go, no. And he goes, well, we're shooting the video tomorrow in Encino. And I said, oh, okay. I said, I'm going to show up. And I just showed up. So, uh, but we didn't talk for a long time, bro. Like for a long time. But now it's all love. We put all that shit behind us. You know, we talk. Of course, he told me that he never said that. But I just told him, bro, it, it doesn't make you look good when you don't talk to me for years. You know, and that's I'm gonna what tell you what it was me being in the business, and I would see them people in them offices get these bright ideas because, see, they don't know the connection that we have with the people we making music with, right? right. But in their head, they can see a vision and they think they overthink shit when it comes to marketing, right? right? I guarantee you that the chick that was delivering you the messages was the main one telling him that you should probably be by yourself and pretty much told him. Hey, we want you to do this by yourself and we handle right. this. And him being as young as he was at yeah. the time, probably didn't know how to come and tell you. No, you know what? And I, and I, and I believe that. I don't have nothing against Crawford today, but that's just what happened then. Because I think if y'all, honestly, bro, I think if y'all, because y'all had something. Because we went out to Japan, me and Croft, and when he performed, like he performed that whole album. Yeah. Those people was in the audience singing this shit like, and they don't speak no English word for word. Yeah, yeah. Word for word. And I always want that. I always wonder, like, why didn't they keep that going? Because that was kind of like, I think y'all would have wound up even just doing, I think y'all would have sold even more albums the second one out. I, I do believe that. We had so many things going our way. Like, for an example, 
our first video looked like a damn fucking Godzilla movie. We filmed that shit at the Rodian Swami, and we had an Australian guy named Ian Fletcher c come in. He did Quick's uh, Born and Raised in Compton a video. So I think Crawford thought it was a good idea to get the same guy. This guy didn't know shit. This guy was wearing tight-ass leather pants with no drawers out there at the rhodium, and it's uh, 90 degrees out there, and he's filming us with some bullshit-ass cameras. We spent like 25000 on that video. Mm. It, it, was, it was shitty, okay? So and then we meet two young cats. I think they're 20, 21 years old. We meet them at Disney. They want to produce our next song called Leave My Curls Alone. Okay. And you know who they were, bro? And I became good friends with them all throughout the 90s. I haven't talked to them in years. The Hughes brothers. Oh, yeah. Albert and Allen. And th this was their first video that they uh, were going to uh, uh, direct. So we did it at Venice Beach. And then after that, we did Sitting in the Park. And then after that, they went and did Second to None, AMGs, and then some stuff with you guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one thing that a lot of people didn't know. And this is where I fucked up because I could have been a part of a classic movie. They wanted me to, to have a small scene in Menace to Society. They, they, they mailed me the, the, you know, the script and everything, and uh, I just didn't show up. Why? Because I was stupid. You was on that shit. You was young and still thinking about yeah. the music shit and mad at the world, like, fuck that, I'm not going. Well, well you know, like Steve, he, he had got me a 10-day tour in Germany, another 10 days in Australia, Canada, and Japan to go DJ by myself. Like, this was separate from High C. They wanted me to go on a DJ tour. And I'll be honest with you, man. I said, oh, I'm the next one. How long is the flight? Oh, 13, 14 hours. Now nah, I'm good. Next time. And, and this is one thing that I want to share to the younger generation is that when those opportunities come, take them because they may never come back again and they never came back again. Well, I was, I was the same way. Motherfucker was like, let's go overseas. And I'd be like, fuck that shit. I'd be dreading it, but then... I just push myself to do it. Fuck it, because like you said, you never know when that opportunity gonna come back around again. Uh -huh. So as much as I hate, you know, traveling mm -hmm. and doing all that shit, fuck it. I just came back from Europe. I was over there for two weeks. Oh, no, no, man. I, I've been. I started going to Europe, and I think like '94, '95. Man, the reception over there is just so much more grand than the deals over here. If you'd have went, dude, you'd have been. You wouldn't have regretted yeah, it. You'd have had the time of your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I regretted not being in that movie. I remember he called me. He goes, how come you didn't show up? And I was like, honestly, bro, can we just like do it tomorrow? And he was like, no, nah, we're not going to do it tomorrow. You know what scene I was supposed, supposed to get? It was a small scene. You just had a dude here uh, not too long ago. Uh, the guy that was in, in the movie. Tyron Turner? Yes. Remember he went and took his 5.0 to that one guy that changed his license plates. Mm -hmm. And the mechanic calls him in and he goes, yeah, I changed it. He goes, shut up. That was supposed to be me. The Mexican do at the car yes. place where he picked the car up. From. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. that part right there. That would have been pivotal for you, man. That would have been a crazy movie, man. Yeah, that, that, that would have been crazy, bro. Let me tell you one thing if they watch uh, DKK, I love you guys, quick. I love you guys, crop. I love you guys. They were all pissed at Albert and Allen because they never got a call for that for a part, but they did. Albert and Allen did tell them, I'm gonna get you a part in the movies, and they never got their script, so they were mad for a long time because. I got mine. And they never got it? No, they never did. They never got it. Coco, I want to ask you this, dog. You being independent, you know, right now, mm -hmm. you know, running your program the way you do, because which, the way you do your stuff, I actually want to holler at you about, you know, trying to kind of get in the blueprint of that, because that's where I think everything should be getting, right? I think the major label is obsolete right now. Absolutely. You know, this is the reign of the independent. You know, um, 0 0.05 versus getting $19, $20 to your own personal website is a big difference. I mean, that's just my opinion. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm wrong. It is because you got people that don't pick your concept. You know, I heard, I heard Kanye on the, um, giving one of his rants. I sell my CDs on my website and I made $2 million already. Right. And I was thinking, I said, man, that shit look like the same shit Coco been doing for the past three or four years. Se 17 you years. true friends. Yeah. yeah, you got true loyal fans and people who really enjoy good music. They'll buy your CD. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you don't sold a, you don't sold quite a few CDs, eh? Definitely do the thing, and I think that's the way. I think that's the way to go now, man. Is there any way, man? And I'm gonna try to facilitate this. You know me. I'm the manager that ain't the manager. Always trying to hook something up, right? I think if you and High C got together and did an album today, I think it would sell, bro. I not think I know it would. 
Bro, I would love to, man. And Crawford, if you're listening, bro, I would love to. We had a talk about this about three years ago. I had brought it up to him. And he goes, who's going to produce it? And I said, I will. You know, and he goes, ah, oh, well, I want some production too. And I said, okay, but I am I am going to be calling the shots on this record. But if we do it, I'm producing it. You know, and he was like, okay, well, we'll see. We never got around to it. And then when it came around to discussing business, you know, I just didn't like it. Uh, just recently, I, I called up my good friend Bobby D. Bobby D Presents, the promoter. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, me and Hasi got back together again. And he just said, okay, cool. Let me know. I'll put you guys on everything. So we're going to start doing shows beginning next month. You know, that'll be good, man. Cause yeah. the game needs y'all. It, it's just certain groups like it's dope seeing cocaine with a bud of law when y'all all, all are together. You feel what I mean? Right. It's, it was dope seeing you and Sugar Free do that project because yeah. I've been waiting. That was like a, a mythical album. I've been waiting for that forever for y'all to do something, you know? Right. Um, it's dope seeing you and I see together. It's dope seeing you with CMW. Like when you and she are doing y'all shit, it's dope. But I think what it is, man. I'll tell you what, the group shit, man, mm -hmm. it's always having to depend on other people to get your work done, dog, is a motherfucker. Right. And it's always people like, for example, the homie Chill, he could never really get his just due because he was always locked up. You know, he always yeah. had something going on. You Pretty feel what chill. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So eight had to carry that whole load. You feel what I'm saying? Right. And I saw it because I, I told eight, I said for the longest, I thought his name was, but Compton Most Wanted was like an alias or something like that. I thought his name was right. Compton's Most Wanted. I'm Compton's Most Wanted because I'd be like, damn, it's this dude, man, that got a group, but I don't ever see nobody else but him rapping. Hear nobody else but him rapping. Right. And then when you was doing this shit with a bud of law, I saw you doing shit with so many people. I was like, where is this? Dude? You know, like, 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 is he a solo artist? Right. Who is that? And when I saw y'all, it was just so unique because you had never seen a black dude with a Mexican dude. And then for the longest, I thought, I ain't gonna lie, I thought Croft was Mexican, half Mexican. Everybody did. Everybody did. So uh, uh, we used to do meet and greets or like in stores and girls are like, we'd be like San Diego, all Mexican girls. So you Mexican? And he was like, no. Are you half? No. They were like, well, what are you? I'm black. He had a long ass jury curl, wet, juicy jury curl. And I'm like, I don't know where they get off that you're Mexican. But what it was on a couple of songs, he said some Spanish words and he said them really good. You know, like he said, chinga tu madre, the way you're supposed to say it. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought for some reason, whenever he, was, whenever he would say that, the crowd would go crazy. So when they would meet him, are you half Mexican? And I go, bro, if you're trying to get laid, just say yes. Just say yes, you know, yes. you know, and that was it, man. But, but me and Croft had a lot of fun. My best time on the road was when it was us, uh, me and High C, Second to None, AMG, and Quick in 1990, and we did a Texas tour, and I was spinning for all of them. And we still have videos of, of those, man. Well, I bet you it was some trim out in that motherfucker back then. Oh, bro, it was, it was on and cracking, bro. It was on and cracking. But there were, there were eagles, and I'll say it because... And I won't say who, we would go to Texas, and then they would say, this song is bigger than all you guys right now. Then we would go up north, this song from this group is bigger. So everywhere we went, the promoter wanted one of us to headline, and there was always one guy that had a problem with that. Oh, you already know who the fuck that is. I ain't even going to say the name, but so, y'all know who that was already. Yeah, bro, and he goes, I'm not even, even going to rap then. They want to see you. And I'm like, fuck, bro. Okay. <laughs> I already know who that is. I'm... <laughs> Yeah. Let me come on with this, man. <laughs> I always wanted to ask you this, Cocaine. I know you're not going to answer it, man. I, I know you're not going to answer it, man. But I'm going to ask you anyway because that's my job. Right. When you were with Ruthless Records, right? Mm hmm And the whole thing was going down with Easy, right? You know, the whole thing, the whole war with Death Row and all that stuff, right? Right. And we might have went over this last show if we did. Forgive me. If we, you know, forgive me, but... I've heard things, man. Easy was a little bit into some dark shit a little bit, wasn't he? I ain't gonna answer that. I mean, rap is dark, period. Just put it like that. So basically, all the gangster shit is, is dark. Mm -hmm. Because so, you know, people had this- And I respectfully say that. Oh no, and, and, uh, because I'm saying this to lead up to something. There's always been this thing that Suge just went over there and tore shit up. No, he didn't. And just did that. I don't think, Easy had a lot of weight behind him and he wasn't no punk. 
Not at all. I mean, the NWA movie don't you depict him, him driving down the street. Yeah, I mean, that's not real. No. Yeah, that kind of pissed me off. I mean, the whole thing Eric, about him. Eric, had a, had Eric had guns. He had bazookas. You know, Eric was a gangster. That's what I'm saying. He was a gangster. He had some shit behind him. From Compton. Yeah. Nigga, what you expect? Yeah. <laughs> nigga, what yeah. you expect? And he Hell wasn't he, playing. And, and that, was like, I tell niggas this yeah. shit all the day. Mm-hmm. Niggas was hood niggas before they was rapping, man. Mm-hmm. That rap shit was just like nigga. Just, just came along. Just like nigga, I'm on the corner selling dope. Nigga, I'm going to flip these motherfucking records and make me some money. But nigga, I've always been from Compton and was a gangbanger nigga. Mm-hmm. That shit was always present. And I and I wanted to ask you that, bro, because I know how political shit is. But all that stuff, you know, they show him in the movie like should just come and they just smashing on him. And I'm like, man, I don't know if that happened necessarily just like that. I mean, how do you know that happened by by hearing? Nah, it's 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 much more to the pie than meet the eye when it comes to the Rufus story. Mm-hmm. You know. You can't just tell it in one movie. It has to be 12 series. You know, that's how deep it was. And Eric was connected, you know. You know, a lot of people talk about Jerry Heller. He was an important part of Ruthless, like it or not, because it was the Jewish lane, and, you know, Jews run the game. You know, now it's independent, and no matter what color you are, you can do your thing. But, you know, he, you know Jerry Heller was a significant part of easy get down, you know what I mean? So, you know, with those two, you know, him him being a real gangster, you know what I'm saying? And easy, you know, Jerry Heller having that connection is the reason why JJ Fad record blew up, all those records at Ruthless Records blew up. So he was an important part of the Ruthless tree, like him or not, Jerry Heller. He was, man. Well, actually, you know what? I don't think he get the credit he ever deserved because, of course, everybody wants to paint the picture that, you know, yeah. he came in and took all the ends, which may have been true, which may not have been true. I don't know. You know what I mean? But that's the big thing when you think about Jerry Heller. When people hear Jerry Heller's name, they always want to say, well, he the one that did this and did that. Right. When really, when you look at the numbers, man, that people talk about what they was getting their contract, they was just kind of industry standard. Yeah. At the time. That's what it was. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, yeah. I think people that, when they think about the business, especially back then, when you say you go put somebody's record out, man, and you on a label, mm-hmm. you committing to spending at least four to $500,000, though, mm-hmm. on something you may not get your money back on. Yeah. How many times have we seen people have these big, massive rollouts, especially when the sound scan and the physical shit used to be around, mm-hmm. and you see a motherfucker do 700, 1,000 units the first week out. Right. It used to happen, dog. So for every for every um time the label roll the dice, that's what they're doing. They're rolling the dice. They just hoping it hit. I mean, well they come they, you know, this is the music industry. It's a corrupt business. It started off corruption, started off mob. You know what I mean? So there were times where, you know, uh the mob would come in and double dip, steal records and then sell the records back to the actual company. It was a lot of twisted shit going on. Artists wasn't getting paid correctly. There was only needle in the haystacks of artists that was actually getting paid, you know. But the good thing going with Easy E is that we all had a chance to learn that imprint of real independence. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, he showed us how you know don't compromise your artistry, and your creativity. There's a way that you can utilize controversy to your advantages because you learn it from the Ozzy Osbourne uh, biting out bad heads and whatever. Controversy sells. And he picked up on that. And he just, you know, we were fortunate to have Jerry Heller coming from that time. He was the biggest booking agent in Canada, booking cats like Elton John, Led Zeppelin. So he was already on the soil coming from Canada. So when those two hooked up, it was... It was a business marriage that, you know, is the reason why we all here, to tell you the truth, you know, because those records, everything is based upon when it come off the tree, death row, 50 cent, even us participating at this table, Mm -hmm. it it depends on the success of Ruthless Records, period. Yeah. You know, so. We didn't have no direction of motherfucking music, Mm -hmm. motherfucking, you know, like niggas get a little 
butt hurt when I say we was all fucking techno records and shit. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that was the Macola days too. I mean, we was, it was West yeah. Coast music was techno like a motherfucker. Yeah, Egyptian lover. And and you, mm-hmm. we got our dose of rap hip hop from the East Coast. Listening, Period. you know, getting them East Coast records and shit is how I got turned out. But it still wasn't a representation of what we were doing. You know what the ironic part is, brother? And not to cut you off. The ironic part is, is that, you know, East Coast was telling us, man, y'all did this. But wait a minute. When we heard Scott LaRock, yeah. when we heard even the, the Run DMC, uh, uh, Just Dice, Coogee Rap, Rakim, Schooly D, Schooly D. Schooly D. we yeah, was banging, yeah, we were banging off day music. And then ironically, it's a, the tables turn now. We affect the whole culture. You see people low riding, Crips and Bloods out there. So it was an exchange. You know, it started out in New York, but then we took it over here, and with the exception of what, you know, Easy e did, we, we, it sprouted out worldwide because you had groups like yourself, uh, King T, of course, Mixmaster Spade, Toddy T, That's and all those guys. I got my first dose of, of experience of the hood shit from listening to Todd and Spade and them. Right. And all the mixtape, M Walk and all of oh, that. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, so um, that was my first experience of, of of our our transition into hip hop, right. Easy showed a nigga that we could be a Run DMC or LL Cool right. J. Or right, what, You get me? Right. Because Easy started putting out those records, niggas was only pushing on cassette tapes. You right. get me? Right. You uh, Easy went out and said, "Fuck that. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go talk about you know." niggas in the neighborhood and I'm gonna put a record out. We didn't know that was possible. Mm-hmm. You know, everything was East Coast, you get me? Yep. We knew niggas was making rap records, but like I said, my first shit was listening to Todd and them on the cassette. Oh, absolutely. Rapping about the Klux come out at night and shit like that, mm-hmm. you feel me? So that was my first like, damn, niggas is Bussing about what's going on in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. But when Easy came out, it was like a, you know, poke your chest out because this nigga got an actual record. Right. Like, I know about mixtapes and cassette tapes and shit because I got a gang of them at the house in my in my boom box. Right. But this nigga actually put a motherfucking record out. So yeah. that made you start thinking, shit. And Ice-T, too, of course. Right. You know what Man, I'm saying? but just look at what they laid the foundation for. Because when you talk about cities, when you talk about, like, cities that produce good hip-hop, right, Compton, California is in that conversation right now. And that was the groundwork that was laid, you know, way back then, eight from you to where, like, it seemed like every time Kendrick drop a verse, every time Dot drop a verse, it's like he shake the whole universe up. Right. Right, right. You can tell, you know, me knowing him, I know he's just jabbing right now. That's the cold thing about it. He's just jabbing. He waiting for the response so he can come on and come with the thing. Mm-hmm. You feel what I'm saying? Because I know that kid, man. So Compton, just like Southern California as a whole, you can't, you know, this ain't me no sleeping on the bay or nothing like that, but Southern California as a whole is a monster when it comes to hip hop. You know, you talk about Long Beach, Compton, mm-hmm. you know, South Central Los Angeles. Y'all just laid the groundwork for everything, man. Yeah, Pomona. Pomona, yeah, Pomona. A lot of people don't know Pomona. A lot of people like to group Pomona in with the Inland Empire, but it's not. It's the last city in L.A. County. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's it's right. the last city in L.A. County, and it's ruthless as a motherfucker out there. I'm trying to tell you, hey, I'm going to have to get on this road, gentlemen. Go. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate y'all having me because I got to get up extremely early. Well, we can all go out the door together, man. Let's yes, talk sir. about Let's talk about this new project. Well, this is called uh, Funk and the Benches of Dr. Kokenstein. It's a three-album trilogy for your audience out there. And it's going back to the soil. You know, we pushing CDs. We pushing uh, vinyl. I see you got uh, some cassettes merch. right there. And we got, you know, vintage cassette tapes, but it's USB. It's USB, yep. It pulls out. And it's 37 slappers on there. 
You know what I mean? And uh, we did our homework on there. It's live music. It's it's the essence of G-Funk, you know, and P-Funk. It got gangster stuff. It got substantive music on there talking about something because I believe in storytelling. We come from the era where we people love storytelling, Definitely. you know what I mean? So it's, it's getting back to the roots again. And the good thing about it, it's on my personal website at www.buddyboymusic.com because over the years I've been building up a sub substantial amount of people because direct marketing is the most important thing for Definitely. independent. So now, we, you know, we reached that pinnacle, I believe, and and get the people. And uh, it's, it, it, it dropped on my C day, March 10th. And, you know, not the standard. I can put it out when I want. But being playing the devil's advocate at the same time, we also use the um, streaming platforms, but we don't put – full-length albums on there no more. Mm. In order to get any cocaine album from now on, you got to go to my personal website at www.buddyboymusic.com. And we will have that hot link in the description, in the show description, so make sure you go down there and check that out. And we go all leave out together, boss. Yeah. We, we go walk out as a family, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely, yes. man. <laughs> Tony, you got a popping uh -huh. poppin live stream slash podcast, man. The rodeo the air is when? Um, every Wednesday and Sunday. Every Wednesday and Sunday. And on Fridays, it. I do my paranormal one. Oh, you do the paranormal about UFOs uh, and spaceships and stuff? Bigfoot, exercise. You got to have me oh, on there. You stuff. know I'm in all that shit. Eight won't let me talk about it on here. So I, you got to have me on there one time to talk about that it. shit. Yeah, absolutely. But that's hey, that's dude, what I've been doing. I love that door. Yeah, I, I love I that. let him get down on here, though. Yeah, we, eight, 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 eight got some show. Yeah, we a family, so he won't <laughs> let me talk about it. But I'm in all that shit, man. What time that come on? Eight o'clock every Friday. I have a, it's a different podcast. It's a uh, it's called Freaky Tales. Freaky Tales, Tales with a Z. Oh, he definitely wants to be on. Yeah. Uh, we're not gonna be doing no. We not talking about no Diddy shit. We talking about UFOs and Bigfoot and all tales. that stuff, man. Mm -hmm. Freaky Tales podcast, yeah. So, and then what we do, I bring up a topic, talk about it for about thirty to forty minutes, and then I open up the calls. I get calls from everywhere, bro. That's dope, man. I can't wait, man. You gotta have me on there. Yeah, let's do it. You let's do it. On there, man, Freaky sure. Tales. Yeah. You want to be on Freaky? <laughs> I want to go in and talk about all that, man. <laughs> man, we appreciate, man. What's your YouTube channel? Uh, Tony Vision. Tony Vision. Yeah. Make sure y'all go check the Rodeon podcast out, man, and Freaky Tales out over at Rodeon Vision. And my man, Cocaine, make sure y'all hit buddyboyentertainment.com. Yeah, that's www.bude, is in Eric, B O Y music.com. Dot com. Mm -hmm. We appreciate y'all chilling out with us tonight. Oh, and I, before we go, Oh, for the, for the people looking at the video, I know y'all see these dominoes and stuff. We go start slapping. You know, I, I tried to give them to slap some bones tonight, but shout everybody was scared. From side action. You know, fire that. shout out to the homies from Side Action Gaming, man. Make sure y'all hit them up at sideactiongaming.com, man. They got the ones, man, for the, you know, for the ones that like to the smoke. They love smoky smoke. They got a whole little package in here for you. So make sure you hit them up at sideactiongaming.com. Mention GC20. Put GC20 in the code to save 20%. And we out of here. Oh, good. Oh, you know what? Before we go, shameless plug, gangsterchronicles.net be coming in a week. We're going to have a lot of stuff. That's going to be the place where you can go, you know, to see all our videos. We're going to give you some exclusive stuff on there. And we're going to kind of take that model, which you've been doing, right. you know, with the regulars and kind of like right. taking control of some of our visual content, just like, you know, you want to see this come over here. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's all about controlling the purse, man. Exactly. And really, really. The biggest thing, too, is having a direct connection to your fans. Right. To where they can connect directly to you and you can connect directly to them. Because, see, you got to remember, YouTube, you can have a million subscribers. You don't know where none of those people are at. You can't get right. in touch with them unless they leave you a comment. And you probably not going to even see that, you know? Right. It's about just really touching the people. But we out of here. All good. That's love. Gangsta yeah. Chronicle. Oh, you know what? <laughs> Almost fucked up. That voice you hear every episode at the beginning, I, I guess that count as one of your features, man. You and the broken the podcast and all that shit. Absolutely, man. I was happy to do that for my comrades. Yo, my man, well, I my brothers. It. When I first got it, I remember I hitting mean, Brown like, nigga, we got cocaine on the intro. Ain't nobody gonna fuck be able to fuck with us. All good. You know what I'm saying? We gone. Pinocchio, we gon' tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. Extra oh. chronic.